Welcome to Antarctic Stories, a podcast that takes you behind the scenes into the rich world of people who live, work, and undertake daring expeditions in the polar regions. My name is Heather Thorkelson, and I'll be your host today. Ted grew up in California, whale watching and getting seasick in Monterey Bay from the time he was a toddler. He's the son of a naturalist and zoology professor couple whose shared mission in life was to educate the public about wildlife. In 1980, his parents founded Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris. In 1994, Ted joined the company as a leader of ecology-based wildlife safaris working on all seven continents. After earning a Master's of Science in Conservation Biology from Duke University, Ted returned to the company to lead polar expeditions. Since that time, Ted has been deeply involved in all aspects of Antarctic tourism management. He served on the Executive Committee of the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators for five years, where he helped minimize the environmental impact of tourism in Antarctica. With over three decades of experience in ecotourism, much of it in Antarctica, Ted has experienced firsthand the impacts of humans on marine ecosystems. While some current trends are encouraging, the recovery of many great whale populations, for example, many trends highlight the challenges facing marine wildlife. In 2015, Ted stepped back from his role directing Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris to focus on marine conservation. He is currently a PhD student building a global catalogue of individual humpback whales as the founder and CEO of the Marine Mammal Citizen Science Platform, a whale identification and tracking website, happywhale.com. With his extensive experience as a leader in whale-focused tourism, Ted sees a huge opportunity to leverage this innovative citizen science program to capture data that will allow us to further our understanding and protection of whales and help us better understand whales as individuals. Furthermore, Ted is the owner of Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris and sits on the board of the Polar Citizen Science Collective. When not at work or aboard a ship, Ted prefers to be kite surfing, backcountry skiing, or rock climbing. Ted Cheeseman, welcome to Antarctic Stories. Thank you. Nice to be here, Heather. Yeah, great to have you on the show. I know so many people who know you, and yet I've never had a chance to actually speak to you directly. So this is really exciting. Get to ask you all about the great initiatives that you're involved in. Now, obviously, what we heard about in your bio, you grew up with parents that were really steeped in the natural world. You were right on Monterey Bay. Where did the passion specifically for whales come from, given that you spent all this time traveling around the world doing things with lots of different animals? What is it about the whales? Whales. Why whales? I think it's that, like, it's one of those questions that might not be relevant if you've had over had a whale come up right next to you. And I guess I've... I'm, I'm sort of happiest feeling small in a big natural world and uh, whales definitely do that. It's also though, I think most specifically. So in, I first went to Antarctica in 1994, South Georgia just turned me on. So, so South Georgia fired me up. And I, one of the amazing things about South Georgia is here is this place that was, I think the three of the five most productive whaling stations in history were there, like all right next to each other. There's, there's more whales in that in those waters than anywhere else in the world. And yet from 94 through 2010, we didn't see a single near shore large cetacean, right? Not a single whale near the coast. So and then started seeing kind of one and two and then gradually more. And now you hear occasionally the stories of super aggregation was seen. Probably several hundred humpbacks were seen up around Shag Rocks this last year by several different vessels. And the Antarctic feels like a place that no one's ever touched. But when you actually dig into it, we've had a pretty big impact on the place. And it's just super amazing to me that here's this population we hunted down to near commercial extinction or to commercial extinction, near biological extinction, yet they are recovering because we stopped killing them. And we are witnessing it firsthand. Like now I can go to the Antarctic Peninsula, I go to Wilhelmina Bay in February and I can just, you know, point my Zodiac in that direction. And I know we will find whales. Like it doesn't matter. They're there. 
it's really cool to be present to that recovery. So not only is it an amazing animal that's very hard to understand because they're elusive, but it's also something that there's a real live ecological dynamic here and a positive one. This is something that we can, it's not just that perpetual, oh my God, there's less this year than there were last year. Yeah, there's a lot of conservation problem, problems that whales face, but there's also a lot of there's a great story there. Here's these recovering populations. Most of the great whale populations are either in recovery or relatively, we think in some cases, close to their pre-whaling numbers. But yeah, I think it's also, it's a place that I can make a real contribution, but it's also something deeply inspiring. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, if if you're someone who's, you know, if there's anyone listening who's been to Antarctica and has had that experience of a whale coming up next to your <laughs> zodiac or, or California even, anywhere where you have these big creatures and you get near one, it's really hard not to be massively impacted by that. So on that note, I don't know if you can answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. What was your most memorable whale encounter? Um, well, I was picked up by a whale once that was pretty memorable <laughs> <laughs> how did that happen <laughs> yeah it was it was pretty awesome it was pretty intense they um i was in in the dominican republic actually in the silver bank which is a um a reef about 80 miles north of the archipel of the of the nation where there's a few vessels that are licensed to be able to do swim with operations get in the water with the whales it's done. It's, I'm really impressed by it. We've been doing this for many, many years. Done, I think, in a way that's really responsible for the whales. But um, some years back, so the typical interaction, if there is a typical, is you have maybe a mother and a calf, and they're hanging out, and then kind of come up to the surface and you kind of cruise by, and you you know are blown away by their size, and then off they go. And then occasionally you'll have maybe a male and female. We'll often call them dancers. They're sort of doing what we think is pre, um, you know, mating courtship behavior. This one particular female happened to be quite curious about us. She would, instead of the kind of like cruise on by and more or less ignore us, accept that we're there. And if they don't want us there, there's, you know, half a kick of their fluke and they're out of sight. But rather than, you know, she was curious. She started swimming up to us and it was, it was pretty intense. She would literally just like swim within just a few feet and kind of then just stop in a way that was not threatening. It was just very obviously intensely like curious about us individually. So that happened one day and we were all in the water having just this incredible encounter. Two days later, she showed up again and kind of like swam up to actually one of, one of the guides with our, with our group. And he didn't back off or anything. He just kind of stayed there filming and she poked her nose under and started to lift him up and then proceeded to do this basically to in succession, each of us. Wow. Um, and I mean, it was like an Island coming up, you know, the scale it's even with as much time as I've spent really close to whales when they approach us, charge up on them and kind of hang out peacefully. And if they want to, if they're curious they come up and approach us. Um, and that happens a lot, even with that. It's, it's just, it's almost impossible to grasp like how tiny we are compared to them. But here's this like literally this Island coming around us. And I think actually almost as memorable, pretty much right there with that experience was five years later, that same whale we encountered her again and we were cruising along. It had been kind of not very good day, pretty windy, pretty choppy. And we see these two whales just kind of turn towards our boat, like a little bit curious. And so like, oh, okay, well, let's, let's see what they're doing. And we get in the water and this female just swims right up to us again. And it, it was the same whale. I thought so at the time based on, I mean, I'd seen you know, looked at my own pictures of this, this, this whale quite a bit. So she had some uh, consistent scarring, thought it was the same whale, but because it, rules have since been changed. So as to say, you know, we do not touch the whales. We don't like, if they approach us, we back off. 
And so we did, we were consistently kind of backing away a little bit. So she didn't, I don't know, maybe she would have, but she wasn't picking us up. But there was one point where a buddy of mine and I were super bumpy. We're hanging, literally hanging off of the boat hook at the front of our tender. And she comes up right under us. And literally her eye is just like two or three feet away from us. He was filming at the time. I was just yeah, I mean, the most amazing experience. At one point, she rolls over because their eyes are on, you know, they can't, they can see in stereo a bit underneath them, but their their eyes are more like a prey's eyes are positioned on the side of their heads as opposed to sort of predator. And they're not prey yeah. per se, but their eyes are not used so much for spotting prey. And uh, anyhow, they can't really, they don't really have much in the way of stereo view. So she literally rolled over she's looking at us with one eye and rolled over to look at us with her other eye turned back <laughs> and then you can see her eye going back and forth between the two of us it was just i mean the level of curiosity and i mean i i don't really speculate too much about um you know how smart are they especially not in the context of like Oh, you know, sometimes it's said, oh, a chimp is as smart as a four-year-old human or has the intellectual capacity mm-hmm. of a five-year-old or whatever. I think mm-hmm. their 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 consciousness and their mindset and their space is quite different from ours. But there's a lot going on in there. And that's super obvious. And to have an experience like that, which is just like, here is this animal that the scale of its power is vastly, vastly beyond what we could muster on an individual level and yet just totally, totally safe, totally gentle, totally just curiously checking us out. That hmm. pretty memorable. And it was super fun to then find her by way of fluke photos, confirm that she was the same whale in the two years. And then also we we've, we've, we've found her elsewhere kind of, you know, follow the whale a little bit through, through the world. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I I got chills listening to those mm. stories. And you're right, being able to track them through the fluke photos and, and, and matching it up. It's, you know, something that I was only introduced to a couple of years ago. So that's great, because that leads me into the whole concept and, and um, project that you developed, which is Happy Whale. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about Happy Whale? Tell us a little bit about the whole fluke identification, mm-hmm. because I'm sure a lot of our listeners are not even aware that that's a thing. And it's quite yeah. fascinating. Well, just as we are individually recognizable, like it's pretty obvious, we don't, you know, so we don't even think about that. Of course, we know, you know, all of our friends and family and memorable faces Many, many, many animals are individually recognizable by features, by calls, by, you know, a wide range of characteristics. For humpback whales, the underside of the tails have convey a lot of information, right? So it's a bit like a fingerprint, but something that you can see from far away, photograph. It's both the shape and pattern. They will often have natural pigmentation patterns, sometimes just incredibly beautiful, like starburst patterns or fireworks or, you know, whatever, um, a variety of patterns. But then they'll also conveniently tend to scar black on white and white on black. So like there'll be barnacle scars and, uh, you know, sometimes it's scarring from interactions between whales, sometimes entanglement scarrings or killer whale is a common one. You have a, kill, a, a whale was attacked by a killer whale in their, in their youth. And so you get these rake marks where killer whale grabbed onto the tail and then, but then the whale got away, but there's, you know, kind of tear marks or scraping of the teeth, which will last the whale's lifetime. So by the time a whale is maybe two, well, sometimes from very young, but usually from sort of a year, two years, three years, they will tend to have a pattern that's fairly clear and persistent through the life of the whale. This has been used since the 70s to to really great ends for science, basically saying, okay, we saw this whale one year, another year, another year. And then as at a population level, you can do some really excellent mark recapture studies, basically population estimates and so on and so forth. So really powerful. There's been some big landmark studies and then large areas that just really haven't been you know, well studied. For example, the Antarctic Peninsula population has never been assessed. It's never, we, we have no comprehensive estimate on numbers and 
to me, this is like, it was one of these things like here we have all these vessels going to Antarctica, all these photographers, you know, photographers, especially once digital photography came along. It's like, wow, here's all these great photos. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're not getting to scientists. And at the same time, it actually kind of came about for me from one particular event. I, I photographed a whale. It was the first year I brought a digital camera to Antarctica, 2004. Photographed a whale. It was in uh, outside of Deception Island, Bramfield Strait. Beautiful shots. And back then, it was like so novel that we could look at our photos. So I'm zooming in. I'm looking at my photo, <laughs> and we I could see these killer whale rake marks. I'm showing it off to some of our passengers. Like, oh, check it out. This whale had been attacked by you know as a as a guide. Like you always want to have a story to share. Something about you didn't see that, but here I can I can you know shed a little more light on 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 what your experience just was so i had been looking at this photo a bunch and then two days later we visited palmer station down there on anvers island and i walk into the men's bathroom and there's this beautiful shot of the Gerlach straits and there's a whale and a fluke and it's the whale that i'd seen two days before and no like, way oh, that's my whale in the bathroom <laughs> at the men's room palmer station so but there were kind of two you know like Cool, fun, but at the same time, it's like, well, there's a story here, and I don't really have access to it. You know, there's there's history in this whale that I don't know. At the same time, I, there's a scientific value in my photo plus that photo there, this whale seen twice, so obviously in different years. There are a number of efforts or there were a number of efforts that were gathering photos, but it was just like, there's no feedback process really, really, you know, it was incremental and, and, and difficult. Yeah. There's a photo shared by email and then you don't know actually where it was taken and so on. And we, so the goal here was like, Hey, can we, can we build a system to make this consistent, make it happen at a high volume, make it happen that, you know, somebody sends a photo, they hear about their whale you know, okay, the idea was found, or oh, that whale's new to science, and then the whale's seen again next year. They get a follow up email or a notification, or that kind of thing. So I tried to get, I, I talked to a handful of different scientists, just saying like, hey, you should, you should do this. And then I, I grew up next to Silicon Valley. It's kind of like, All right, we can, we can do this. It was just at the end of the day, it was like this kind of, well, we want it done. And I found a couple collaborators to 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 dive into it. We decided to do it ourselves. So. It was really an experiment. Like, can we get automated Im image recognition to work? Can we get enough people to participate that it's worthwhile? Can we, you know, build the software, build the background? And, and it turns out to be yes on all fronts. Um, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's proving actually really only just about a month ago, thanks to a Google-sponsored and, and uh, supported algorithm development competition, we have new a new image recognition system whereby um we literally like we can pretty much guarantee if it's a decent photo we can match that photo to any known whale so we have oh i think closing in on thirty thousand whales in our wow. data set um, wow for antarctica this is i mean it used to be that one in about 20 photos we would find a match to now it's like one in five in hmm. California, we know probably 80 plus percent of individuals and, you know, we're not always going to know all of them because there will be babies born. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's really neat. We found a match uh, recently between Tonga and Costa Rica. So that was a first, you know, this is these long range, these areas that are connected that we don't really think of the whale populations being connected. Yeah. And along with that, literally hundreds to, in some cases, thousands of notification emails going out every week saying, hey, your whale's been recited. And, oh, yeah, that whale that you you photographed that's new to science. And it's it's engaging and fun. And that part, yeah. that's really what keeps us going, I think. So. Yeah, I can imagine. And, I mean, I don't find it surprising that the technology has come through for you. But I'm really curious to hear about how you got the human beings on board. Like, how did you start getting people excited and willing to remember to take photos of the underside of the fluke and send them in? Because that, like, that's the hard bit, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it can be. It's certainly the messy bit, right? You know, <laughs> like, people don't follow instructions, don't read, don't just like... <laughs> I mean, the simple equation for me has been from the beginning, like as a, as a experienced 
person in the field, as a guide, I know, you know, people, they want to do interesting, challenging things, but only if it's rewarding, right? So it's our approach has been like, let's make it as easy as possible, but also more importantly, like, and, and that's a, a pretty common trend in citizen science efforts. Like, yeah, you got to make it easy. I think the kind of the critical element is making it rewarding. And that's mm-hmm. totally missed somehow in a lot of these efforts. It's like, oh, tell people they're contributing to science. They should be happy with that. Like, eh, that's that's <laughs> nice. But like, come on, give me something. And, and contri- knowing knowing that you've contributed to science is something, but it's also like not in the abstract. It's not very valuable in the abstract. It's like incrementally show me, you know, oh, I contributed this idea of this whale and being able to reward people with, hey, your whale's been seen again. It, may, it might be six months later. It might be two weeks later. It might be five years later. But, you know, these whales, the long-lived creatures, that element of giving people a reward, and it might, many of these whales, we are finding recites to a high recite rate. That reward turns out to be really motivating. And what I often see happening is someone will hear about this. They'll be curious. They'll send us two or three or five photos and then when they see that we can identify their whale, they kind of go, oh, well, that's, that's, that's cool. I didn't know that my whale that I saw in Antarctica actually breeds in Panama, right? And then they think about, oh, yeah, actually, I was whale watching off of Australia last year. I think I had some good photos. And they start digging back in. And we've had this where it just like instead of it being a one-off, our best contributors are the, the well, the naturalists, the guides, the whale watch operators, the like serial whale watchers, people that really get into it. So they set their cameras right and they put a GPS on their camera and they do this extra steps. That, yeah, it's not that difficult, but it's, you know, a little bit of extra effort. And we have, you know, some contributors who have literally have thousands of images in here. And so for them, there's often a handful of whales, whales that have names that they know of, they've had experiences with that they're particularly interested in seeing again, or, you know, it, that, that part, making it rewarding, I think, has been mm-hmm. the biggest engaging part. So it started slowly, for sure. But, um, you know, just really kind of word of mouth and people seeing that it worked. And it went from individual naturalists and participants to now at the company level. I know some some tour companies are saying, we want our participants to have access to this. Mm-hmm. So we'll print up a photo ID catalog of, hey, here's all the whales that your company has seen in Monterey Bay or in Antarctica. You know, something that's fairly, now that we've built the information and architecture, like we can just generate a PDF here's your whale. So it's something that can sit in the lounge on the ship. So people are checking it out at night and then thinking, oh, wait, the next day when they go out and photograph, they're already primed to it. Um, Yeah. 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 I I think it's so magical in that it is a project that personalizes the animals for people. Right. And as we all know, it's, it's easy to not care about something if you don't feel a personal connection to it. It's easy to not really care about what's happening in, in the Arctic if you haven't been to the Arctic or not care about polar bears if you haven't seen a polar bear. But everything changes when you have an experience with that place or an animal or whatever. And so it's, it's really genius that you give people the opportunity to continually hear about the, the, the location and well-being of this animal that they once saw, because you can never really look at whales the same way again, right? It's, I hope it's so. Just, totally. Yeah. I mean, I think it's more persistence than genius. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> the reality here is that, like, yeah, it's, we care about animals. But for me, I'm against animal cruelty. But if someone threatens my dog, yeah. that's a big deal, right? That's a wholly different <laughs> yeah. thing than knowing that there are some malnourished dogs in Mexico, like, yeah, my dog's a rescue. I care to reach out and do that. But at this point I care about him as an mm-hmm. individual. And it's the same way, you know, we, we, I mean, we've totally seen it where there's an entangled whale reported in Monterey Bay. Okay. You know, there's an effort of an entanglement response, but there was a case of an, a, a known whale, this blue whale named Delta. And like, it was like, whoa, big deal. Delta is entangled. And and there was a lot more engagement with that. Sadly, yeah. Delta has not been seen since. 
And that to me is a really big deal. Like if we, I mean, it's, it, it, it veers us away from the scientific and I think there's, well, there's things to be aware of when we're using the same data for science and the same infrastructure for science and public engagement. But we do have a practice of like, if naturalists have named the whales, we put them in here and they're searchable. You can go in and say, oh, what happened to, when was the last time that vertigo was seen? Or, you know, all Mm -hmm. these whales that are, and some of these whales have been known for decades now. And that, that, brings these issues these conservation issues in from being out of sight out of mind and i think that's really key because like yeah the biggest single threats to whales today are ship strikes and entanglements in terms of like direct you know there's lots of population potential issues climate change fisheries but like very clearly whales are getting run over by ships they're getting entangled in in particularly pot fisheries but uh, fishing gear in general Mm-hmm. At numbers that are like, quite frankly, jaw dropping and, and we don't really know the numbers, but if you model it out based on what we see, it's kind of terrifying and stunning, but it's out of sight, out of mind. So mm-hmm. if we can, and I'm not trying to do a shock and awe, oh my God, everything's so horrible. But at the same time, if people can generate that, you know, if, if I can build a tool that can make these animals be you know, closer, more personal, more meaningful, that that one experience with a whale becomes a lifetime of knowing that your whale, Frosty, showed up again in Mexico and then came back with a calf. Like, that's a very different story. And I think it makes us care a lot more about the oceans. Yeah. And it yeah. and it allows us to then be better advocates for the oceans in the way that we can as human beings, right? Yeah. It's Yeah, yeah it's we're emotional. Really... And that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. we very much are. Yeah. So... I love this stuff. I could ask you a million questions about Happy Whale, but I wanted to shift gears a little bit because we have already had Alison Cusick on the program. We've had uh, Bob Gilmore, all your Polar Citizen Science Collective buddies. Um, (laughs) So, and you've been involved in the Polar Citizen Science Collective from the very beginning. So maybe you could shed a little bit of light for us on the beginnings of that. You seem to be at the beginnings of a lot of things. (laughs) (laughs) That that might just mean that I'm not very good on follow through, but um, (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, the Polar Collective is, I was, I I think, so there's five of us founders, but I was sort of the the fifth and last. Um, I I, I sort of saw this train just, just leaving port, leaving, uh, leaving the station. And I jumped aboard um, Bob, Annette, um, Lauren and Alex, uh, and then myself, basically the four of them came up with this idea of like, look, here's these projects that we're seeing in their infancy and what could we do? Like we're, we're seeing that, you know, these things that have so much potential and they're maybe they're meaningful as they are, but achieving 1% of what we might imagine them to be. I had, when I started hearing about this, I had built Happy Well to a pretty functional place. It was definitely not where it is now, but um, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Really the idea here is like, the platform of opportunity of tourists, in particular tour vessels, but tourists as a whole, traveling to these polar regions, these are places where it's just absurdly expensive to get science done. So it's cost limited, right? And so there are things that you can do off of a polar vessel that you can't do off of a research vessel because these polar vessels are there day after day after day. I mean, and, but obviously the opposite is also true. There are things that a dedicated research vessel can do that a polar, you know, tourism vessel definitely cannot. We're not going to be out doing, sitting in one place doing, you know, sort of time depth recording samples or following a, a, a certain contour in an oceanographic study. There's, you know, so it's, we're not trying to replace traditional science, really, I I see it as basically it's like, look, if we can develop this platform of opportunity so that one, a lot more science gets done um, because it works, right? And what we've Mm -hmm. seen is a lot of polar, a lot of citizen science projects kind of like great idea, but then that person got their degree and left or, oh, but then it was a little disorganized and people just didn't participate. So like, Mm -hmm just a little bit of facilitation, or in some cases, a lot of facilitation, getting it on more vessels, and then also making it rewarding so that people are engaged. And that's the, that's the part of it that I feel like we can do a lot to facilitate so the projects happen better. And then, mm-hmm. 
even more, we knowing the context of expedition guiding, we can we can make it a rewarding experience. And to me, that feeds back to the former, which is you make it rewarding. The tour operators hear after the fact, oh, our clients said the best time of their lives was when they got to record data alongside a scientist. <laughs> like we're going all the way to the Antarctic and someone's peak experience was writing down data because it yeah. felt meaningful, you know? Yeah. And like, that's, it's yeah, like, yeah, you took an awesome photo of that penguin along with everyone else there, but who gets to really participate in science? So making that possible gets the tour operators to say, actually, we want a new position on our ship. We want a polar uh, citizen science coordinator. It was really awesome. Actually, you said you had Allison on here. Allison joined us back in February as our citizen science coordinator aboard nice. the voyage that I led in February, early March. And it was amazing to see when you take that step of making it a little more organized, you know, a little bit of planning, it's not much work and it's almost free, but mm -hmm. just a little bit of planning and suddenly it becomes a, mu a much, much more accessible experience. Almost everybody aboard ship ended up you know, doing the plankton trawls with her at some point and looking through the microscope in the bar and going like, whoa, that's, you know, I mean, the moment when she showed me the diatome that is on the tail of the whales in the Antarctic is water so cold that the whales just get covered with diatomes because they're not able to regenerate their skin. And it's, it's this little diatome that I never knew this, but called Coco Nais. And a cool looking thing under a microscope. It just looks like yellow and orange slime on a whale went there. And, you know, that moment I, it's just massively memorable for me. And, you know, and I have photos of our group, like people just like super wrapped with attention, <laughs> focusing on a microscope, having a beer, chatting in the bar. But instead of chatting about like whatever politics, they're talking about Antarctic plankton biology and to me that's like yeah i mean seeing the the budding the in polar collective in its infancy it's like cool what what can i do to help this be you know fully more fully fledged and i i mean it's really awesome to see the traction we're getting so yeah 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 absolutely it's the theme that we've heard a lot about over the past little while and definitely with the other guests we've had it, it, it is really getting traction. And I love that you guys had the foresight to band together, essentially, and say, well, we've got these different projects. We've got Happy Whale. We've got Fjord Fido. We've got the, you know, so many different little things that by themselves might not survive, as you say. But when you pull them together, there's a bigger value proposition there for the companies that you need the buy-in from. And you're right. It's absolutely transformative for the people who, who choose to be involved. And also one of the things that's so fascinating, I find, is that when people go to the polar regions, you know, to Antarctica, we're always so blown away by the size of everything. Everything's huge. Like the whales are huge. The icebergs are huge. The mountains are huge. There's snow everywhere. The penguin colonies are huge. And yet the citizen science allows us to see all these little microscopic little things that you wouldn't otherwise have any awareness of and also understand how they fit into the ecosystem and what's happening to them in that ecosystem. And with the change in sort of just general awareness, I suppose, about what's happening in the climate. We're getting a lot of news reports about Antarctica and krill populations and da 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 da, da. And it's, it's one thing to hear about it on the news. It's an entirely different thing to be down there looking in a microscope and having someone who's passionate about this stuff say, this is what you're looking at. This is where it fits within the ecosystem. And this is what it means in the context of the climate change that we're seeing in this region. I mean, it's just, it's next level, right? I'm not surprised that that it has gotten such traction. And I think it's very exciting. Based on your experience, having been there from the beginning, where do you see the polar citizen science programs in general in five years from now? I'd love to see that most, you know, most ships have an active science program aboard. Like it's not for everyone, but that's totally fine. Like if you have a hundred passengers on your ship and it, makes one person come back home and just be like, I really did want to go back to school and get that degree, you know, or whatever, become that advocate. To me, that's a super strong success. So, but I think that happens when the, the companies involved see the value 
and they make space for it. They make it a role where there's, you know, the company might have a head science coordinator at, mm -hmm. at, a, at a corporate level. And then on all of their voyages, they have a science, you know, a citizen science coordinator as part of their expedition staff responsibilities, rather than it being one more thing a guide has to do in a day. It's something that is actively, it's somebody's job to really make sure this stuff works and make sure that it, uh, to, you know, and that, I think that's the single greatest facilitating factor. A lot will flow out of that. So in five years to me, it's like, well, I, you know, I know more of these vessels have Wi-Fi aboard that's pluses and minuses. They're less isolated, but yet they have access to resources. So it's cool to me. I mean, already now somebody can send me a, um, you know, come back from, from, from their day in the field and send me a photo and we can ID that whale so that at their after dinner briefing, they can say that whale that you saw today is new to science or that whale that you saw today was, had a calf in Panama two years ago or, or, you know, was seen in Colombia or, whoa, you know, really unusual was from Tonga. More of that, I think, this kind of thing, like right now, it's still the rare individual that comes back and has had that experience. You know, probably just a few percent of, of polar travelers have access to this. And I, I mean, I'd really like to see it that 10 or 20 percent of participants in these regions. Because to me, if you're going to if we are going to, as a species, invest the resources, as it were, you know, burn the fuel, we know we have a very carbon intensive industry here if we're going to put that kind of resources into this travel i think it should stick i think people should come back home changed and i really feel that the meaning conveyed in being participatory in science being involved in something that isn't just take a picture of a penguin but it's uh, like yeah you know you taught the world something about that penguin or that whale that sticks in a way that, um, and I, I want to see that, you know, accessible to a large portion of, of travelers. And the other thing is I want to know what's going on down there. I mean, we have, like I said, you know, the whale population never, never been assessed. We are involved with a population assessment of the Antarctic Peninsula. It's called the Stock G, the, the population that breeds on the West Coast of South America. We are probably the single biggest data contributor because we have hundreds and hundreds of photographers whether than well other data contributors you know their data sets are the efforts of a, a small research group right in one place in south america or so forth we're generating now near on a thousand humpback whale encounters a year so it's it's there's and i think it's the time is upon us to really be able to see what's going on we have more ships going down there that creates a risk to the environment we just passed and i'm really really delighted by this iato the international association of antarctic tour operators largely based on the effort involved of people really looking at this and it's I, I wrote a proposal put put forward hey we need to be aware that we're a risk to these whales mm -hmm. and as such we need to respond um there's areas where we should operate more slowly when whales are you know as in the risk to whales is much lower if a ship is operating operating at roughly 10 knots or less. And so this year, as of this coming season, there is a time area that all vessels will operate at those that speed or below or have an extra watchman on board. I want to see that we are contributing to science that helps inform that. You know, it may be that we didn't choose the right area. It may be that we didn't choose the right season. It may be that we can create and this is my hope that well within five years, we actually have a dynamic system where we say, okay, you know, great. November, not many whales on the Antarctic Peninsula at any speed. And then some years the whales migrate in sooner than others. So let's say it's, you know, second week of January and suddenly the density of whales has reached a cr certain critical threshold. Cool. Now is time to slow down vessel operations to a whale safe speed. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's totally reasonable, but it will take collaboration and commitment on the part of, of uh, tour operators. I, I see that commitment there. It's just for, for us, it's really building the facilities to, uh, to make it possible. 
So now I understand that there's also an app that you're developing for Polar Citizen Science. Are you able to talk a little bit about this app? Yeah, super amped about this. It was really um, we we two years in the making in terms of Booking.com, the 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 travel company has a sustainability initiative called Booking Cares, and they offer a grant for change making efforts. Oftentimes, it's tech related in order to make tourism more sustainable, more you know, locally, in, in, in any ways that uh, tourism can help the, um, the environment, society, so on. And so we, we got a grant to basically build a polar citizen science app or a citizen science app that it's being initially very targeted to polar vessels. But basically what it is, is extending the happy whale functionality. We've been building that for years as a web app, extending it into a mobile platform, but also in that making it modular in a way. So so what we see, and this is like a lesson that I got out of working with the Polar Collective, we all have these different uh, efforts uh, you know, Alex and Lauren more focused on climate and ice and stuff and so on. Every effort runs into the same problems. And these are a lot of, it's, it's kind of the who, what, where, when. The same information architecture, the same technology in a, built in a modular way could really answer this for a wide range of, of citizen science projects to make it easier to get done in the field. You know, and I mean, it's totally the same philosophy. Make it easier, make it rewarding. The easy makes people show up, right? They'll try it one time because it was easy. The rewarding makes it come back and makes them learn more about it and do better the second time or the fifth time or the hundredth time. This app, um, we're, the initial rollout will be, gosh, just in probably in the next few weeks, super basic skeletal first version, but over <laughs> this this um, this Arctic and Antarctic season, we're going to be demoing it and developing it. And the idea is really to make it so that it's really easy to execute these projects and that there's a ready reward for it, whether it's a map of all the sightings of marine mammals on the voyage or, um, you know, your your observations in the context of all the data that we have for that project. It's, it's, I'm really excited by it. And the, the funding from booking.com was just astronomically enabling, like they just couldn't do yeah. it without it. But also, also it's because of the broad collaboration of the, the collective and then all the, all the field staff that are saying, cool, awesome, give us the tools and we're psyched to, to, to do this. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So is the app something that the, uh, field staff who are involved in citizen science would primarily use, or is this for the average traveler who's Both. involved in citizen science? Absolutely. Both. Yeah. So, so mm-hmm. on the on the back end, we basically will set user permissions. So there's the there's the expert level that that field staff will use to you know record data in potentially with a richer set of fields or. It depends on the project, but um, and and some projects may be only led by field staff. Other projects might be cool. You know, we'll get data from as many participants as want to enter their own sightings, and then an aggregation process, decision rules, alg- you know, algorithm to to bring it all together. So yeah, initially we're initially this summer's testing period is just field staff. So we're totally we're taking. Taking lists and names and volunteers, we got a commitment from a, um, a government, a fin- Finnish government funded project that is actually going to put a handful of GPS units and, and tablets that we can install this on in the Arctic this summer. So I'm psyched, a little bit of contribution there. And yeah, we're, we're basically looking for, um, looking for volunteers. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. And uh, ultimately, I'd love to see it that something that Travelers anticipating going to Svalbard, download beforehand and get content that educates them a bit, you know, what can I get involved in when I'm there so that when they get to Svalbard, when they get to the Antarctic Peninsula, when they get to Greenland, they're already aware that they can get involved in this and sort of bring the conversation so that it's not at square one when there's that first citizen science talk aboard, but they already have relevant questions. The whole thing is like, 
let's push it along so we can have a higher level of participation. Let's push it along so that we can do better science and educate people at a deeper level. I think, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. it'll, it'll hit a lot of bumps in the road, but, but it'll also make a lot of progress. For sure. And I'm certain it's a move in the right direction because we're seeing in the industry that, in fact, more people are checking off the box on their feedback form saying that they chose a certain trip because they offered a citizen science program. So it is already in the minds of travelers when they're looking for trips. And I think making Antarctic ambassadors. There you go. (laughs) There you go. So it's, it's super cutting edge and it's so exciting to hear about this directly from you, Ted. Um, But I got to ask as well, and this is going to be my final question. You are an operator, you're a PhD student, you're a guide, you're running two growing nonprofits. I mean, you're developing apps. (laughs) The list goes on. How do you manage all this stuff? I don't sleep a lot, but no. um, (laughs) And definitely really solid teams behind each of those efforts. I mean, that none of this is a solo gig at all. So yeah, no, I have, I have a lot of balls in the air, but there, there, there's a lot of synergy. And at the end of the day, that's really it. I mean, my, my tour company that my parents founded 40 years ago now, we have a CEO, she's super solid. I am involved in kind of the, where can my understanding and expertise in history here make things go in the right direction. But because I am involved, you said about, you know, people checking the box saying I chose this trip because I, to me, it's like when it has, when this stuff actually has commercial traction, when uh, citizen science is a reason that people go on particular trips, that's when it'll get major traction. So I feel like, you know, running a tour company really helps me know very intimately, what is that meaningful feedback what are people deciding based on not just like oh yeah that was cute but like no i want to go on that trip because i want to focus on whales and whale science that to me i mean that, that it's just inspiring but the other part of it i mean the phd it's it's the neatest thing to be involved at that level of hey we're doing something completely new there's never been a study that's been able to with marine mammals go global and have history and depth in terms of like literally creating a global humpback whale catalog. So that all came about, well, sort of the fault of one particular guy, Phil Clapham, who's my, my major professor. He kind of, uh, I I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that was a good idea for me to get talked into this, but, uh, but it's, (laughs) it's, it's really neat because we're gathering this data and I just was feeling that it's not going to be as utilized as it could be unless unless someone dives into it very directly. And, and uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I intended to go back to science. I finished my master's 20 years, 19 years ago now. And mm-hmm. uh, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll work for the family tour company for a year or two and go back to science. And 15 years went by and I'm finally, <laughs> you know, fully back into it. The first few years of just building the system and then in seeing that it's working. Um, yeah, so they all tie together nicely. And it takes a lot of energy, but cheers. Yeah, no, it's... it's um, it's rewarding. I think that's the main thing is, I mean, I, my whole philosophy of making it easy and rewarding, I'm the one that's getting the biggest rewards out of it. Cause I get to like literally every single whale. And like, I want to know more about that whale. We've found, I've found yeah. it, several in Monterey, a couple in Antarctica, a couple in the Atlantic and every single one of them we found at least one more sighting of. So I'm getting my own rewards and that keeps me going. Yeah. Well, your enthusiasm is infectious. And I think that uh, <laughs> a lot of people are really going to enjoy hearing your stories. And we might even get some requests to have you back on the show. So oh, yeah. in the meantime, I'm going to link to everywhere that you exist in the show notes. So Happy Whale, the Citizen yes. Science Collective, Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris, and all that. So folks will be able to find you um, and also find the great projects that you're involved in and hopefully eventually be downloading the app when it's uh, yeah. user ready for the general public. Give that three or six months. Yeah. Three or six months. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure people will manage. Yes. Just thank you so much for your time and for sharing all of this, all of your great stories with us. It's, it's again, really inspiring. And uh, we hope to have you on the show again sometime. Cheers. It's a pleasure. Heather. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Antarctic Stories. If you like the stories we bring to you, please subscribe for future episodes. And if you want to help the podcast, leaving a rating or review greatly assists us in reaching a wider audience. 
Antarctic Stories is a production of Twin Tracks Expeditions, your experts in small ship expedition cruises to the Arctic and Antarctica. We love sharing our insider knowledge to help you find the perfect ship for your next polar expedition. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, or at TwinTracksExpeditions.com.